Welcome back to the course. I have the pleasure of receiving Christoph Rottballer. He's an expert principal at Boston Consulting Group. He's extremely knowledgeable about questions of infrastructures and public-private partnerships. Among many other things, he has led and recently completed the World Economic Forum's Strategic Infrastructure Initiative. Christoph, everybody talks about the global infrastructure investment gap, but how serious is that really? So I, I personally think it's really one of the big global issues and that view I think is also shared by many of the global institutions from the World Bank all the way to the G20. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we in, within BCG, we've done our own analysis and estimated the annual investment gap to be about one trillion US dollars each year. So it's quite, it's quite a um, massive gap. What are the reasons behind that gap? I think on the one hand, you have in developed countries an infrastructure stock that's aging rapidly. Mm. For example, in my home country, Germany, a third of the rail bridges are more than 100 years old. And on the other hand, you have in the developing countries uh, massive infrastructure needs just because of soaring population numbers, also because of urbanization and industrialization. That's really driving the infrastructure needs there. And on the other side, the supply of infrastructure is quite constrained because of limited government budgets and also some hesitance among the private sector to invest in, into infrastructure. Mm -hmm. There are also a couple of other structural reasons such as low construction productivity or some of the issues in the early permitting phases, land acquisition phases of infrastructure. All this constrains the supply uh, mm -hmm. quite a bit as well. And these infrastructure, um, let's say, limitations also have quite some repercussions in uh, social and economic um, dimensions. On the one hand, there are very immediate things such as all the congestion that we're seeing in ports, in airports that a lot of people are suffering uh, from. But then that also has an impact on economic productivity. For example, for Africa, it's been estimated that if they would solve the infrastructure gap, annual growth in GDP mm -hmm. terms could be two percentage points higher per year. So that could make quite an impressive impact. But even on a social dimension, um, infrastructure really makes a difference. For example, there are studies out there how infrastructure increases the number of students that read at home at night because they have electricity at home, or how paved roads increase uh, girls' school attendance. So all these studies are there. So I clearly think it's a big issue, and it could make a huge impact to the world if that would be solved. So how then can public-private partnerships help address this challenge? I think PPPs can address that challenge in various ways. The first thing is um, PPPs can save uh, costs. And that is because PPPs bundle really various activities across the life cycle from construction, design, mm -hmm. operations and maintenance into one contract and really incentivize the contractor to optimize whole life cycle costs. So it means that the contractor has to design and build the asset in a way that it can be operated easily and also maintained easily over the whole life cycle. And that will really save uh, money. Secondly, um, the government transfers certain risks through the PPP to the private sector. And these are typically the risks that a private sector can very well manage and control. So for example, the risk of uh, construction uh, cost overruns, something that the private sector uh, can, ma can manage very well. And by this risk transfer, mm. government can save money um, as it's not on their balance sheet um, anymore. Thirdly, I think uh, PPPs also um, are a good opportunity to introduce additional innovation into infrastructure delivery. And that can happen on two on two, in two aspects. The one is really on the commercial side. So just imagine the, the many airports that are out there that have really innovated a lot on the ancillary business side. Mm -hmm. And some of the best in class airports mm -hmm. nowadays derive 50% or more of their revenues from such, such businesses as advertising, mm -hmm. retail, hotels on site. And that really reduces the infrastructure funding burden on the government. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there's also technical innovation. For example, in the UK, there's a good example how a PPP contractor applied asphalt preservation surface coating and therefore increased asset lifetime by one third. Again, a clear impact and that is directly incentivized through the long term contracts of a, of a, a PPP. And uh, not only that, a PPP is also typically faster in delivering mm -hmm. a project. There's good evidence that the construction 
um, happens faster because the private sector wants to earn money with those assets, so they construct faster. And secondly, they, you can avoid some of the pay-as-you-go financing that we often see in the public sector, that you build five kilometers of road, then you wait until next more money is there, you build the next five kilometers, because the private sector can tap into additional financing resources, particularly those from institutional investors, and get all the construction done in, in one go. So all these macroeconomic benefits of infrastructure typically occur faster in a, in, uh, with, with PPPs. And lastly, in some settings, PPPs can also help, out, help to filter out certain projects that are not really viable because you have this type of double due diligence, first by the public sector, then by the private sector, then by the banks that are financing the private sector concessionaire. So you really get rid of those white elephant projects that we sometimes see in traditional project delivery. And through all those mechanisms together, PPPs can make quite an impact uh, in terms of costs and in value um, for, for infrastructure delivery. So it's the governments that initiate the PPPs. What do they need to do in order to get the PPPs to work? Yeah, it's obviously PPPs are not an easy undertaking. So there's quite some things that governments need to get right. And that really stretches across the life cycle from project inception to project preparation all the way into implementation. Let's start in, in from the beginning. So I think the first thing they need to get right is select the right project for a PPP. Because not every project is conducive to PPP delivery. So they first need to select projects that make sense from an economic, environmental, and social point of view. And secondly, they need to make sure that the, or assess that the PPP delivery really adds value or saves costs for the government. And once they've chosen the right project, they need to prepare it properly for that type of uh, PPP transaction. There are many elements um, within, within that project preparation phase that starts with a sound and rigorous demand study. And we've seen so many demand studies with inflated uh, traffic forecasts, particularly in the road sector, 30, 40 percent uh, more than it turned out to be. You need to get a rigorous and clear approach to land acquisition and permits to have all the prerequisites, the legal prerequisites for the private sector to, to proceed with, the, with that project. And you also need to get things right around stakeholder engagement. Mm -hmm. Then in the next phase, you need to write the right contract. And that had the most important element in there is really risk allocation. Their governments have to follow, obviously, the fundamental principle within, BC, uh, within um, PPPs of um, allocating risks to the, to the contractual party that is best able um, to manage um, those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, risk sharing is the right way um, to, to go about. And then once this contract is finalized, obviously they have to organize a very transparent and unbiased procurement process and also stay involved because PPPs mm. are a partnership mm. over a long uh, time horizon. So mm. it's not a one-off transaction. Mm. The uh, public sector really needs to stay involved over a long time, uh, support the private sector and also monitor the private mm. sector and how they execute the construction and the operations um, later on. So it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of things they need to do across the life cycle. So PPPs are a partnership. There are governments and there's the private sector. You talked about the governments. What are the challenges for the private sector? Oh, for private sector, it's also quite a challenging thing, such a PPP, if you compare it to traditional contracting. First, the new capabilities that are required uh, from the private sector, because it's not only the design and the construction piece, but all of the sudden construction companies have to operate and maintain an asset for a very long time. Often they might not have these skills in-house, so they need to form partnerships themselves or consortia with operating companies, also with financiers um, to, to do all this. And orchestrating that consortium can be a difficult task. Secondly, it's really because the risks are transferred to the private sector. The private sector has to become really sophisticated about assessing, evaluating, and managing these risks. Um, and there, there is a multitude of them. It could be the traffic going up and down. It could be uh, macroeconomic conditions that change. So really having a plan for risk management is very essential. Thirdly, um, it's really the financing piece that mm -hmm. comes on top um, for the private sector because they, because the public sector kind of shifts those assets off the balance sheet, the private sector needs to finance them. And in times of Basel III regulation, where project finance from banks is more difficult, 
um, this can also be a challenge. And developing the type of skills you need to structure an efficient financing, developing the relationships with the banks, developing relationships with institutional investors, or even setting up funds by their own to bring in third party money into those assets. This is some of the additional challenges that the, the private sector um, is facing. And last but not least, obviously, it's a long term partnership, as we've mm -hmm. mentioned before. Um, and that leaves the private sector exposed to the long political cycle over 30 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And we all know governments change every four to five years. And that leaves them with quite some risk uh, in terms of political and regulatory risk, um, which is obviously something that's not easy to manage for, for a private sector firm. Over time, we have heard about some negative examples of PPPs. What, what are the disadvantages? Yes, no, I fully agree. They're clearly, so PPPs are not fail safe and they are examples of uh, not successful PPPs. For example, in Bolivia, water concession was terminated because of stakeholder opposition. In Spain, we've seen quite a few road concessions being bankrupted after travel, uh, after travel or traffic went down. Um, and there, there are many reasons uh, behind that. But really, the disadvantages um, of, of PPP, they come in, in different shades. First, um, the, the, the public sector kind of loses control over an asset. Mm. And that is particularly a problem in a very dynamic, urban uh, environment sometimes where things are happening fast and you put out a concession for 30 years and then you lose kind of the margin of, to maneuver as a public sector. Mm. Secondly, also PPPs have higher transaction costs. Because of their complexity, they're more complex to structure and that, incur that results in costs. So typically for a PPP, you need to have a minimum threshold of investment so that it actually makes sense. And uh, thirdly, PPPs are, you know, they're over 30 years and there's one contract which is written today. So they're essentially incomplete those contracts. They cannot account for every circumstance that might arise in the future. So there will always be some disputes and many of those disputes can be very costly. You have these renegotiations and the likelihood for such renegotiations is relatively high and that, that can be um, quite expensive in the end. And then lastly also, um, the private sector might have higher costs of financing themselves than the public sector has. So really the PPP needs to have sufficient efficiency gains um, to, to offset uh, this, this disadvantage. And taking this all together, obviously PPP, in some cases it might make sense, in others not. So for each case you need to have a rigorous analysis of the advantages versus the disadvantages and then come to a conclusion whether it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So Christoph, we have talked in the beginning about the global infrastructure investment gap, but you personally, what do you think the future of PPP is? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, PPPs, they've been used, they, they came up in the, in the UK in the 90s, then they spread around the world. And many emerging countries are now adopting PPPs as well. So I think certainly the global a adaptation will certainly go up and there are many PPP programs being set up in countries from Colombia, even in Paraguay, Philippines. So a lot of countries are pursuing that and are convinced that it will have some benefits. But I think there's also an element of learning that we need to embed into PPPs because we discussed before some PPPs have failed and I think there are nicely established best practices how you're supposed to do PPPs but they're not always applied in, in practice. But again, there are many initiatives on the way to get that done. For example, the World Bank has a PPP certification program for, for managers that they're, um, they're instituting right now um, and governments are doing a lot. They're setting up PPP units to spread the escape capabilities more broadly within the public sector to structure PPPs. Also many governments have revamped their previous um, PPP programs, for example the UK with PF2 or Colombia with their 4G program. So I think there's a learning process that needs to be done. And I believe through that learning process that some of the benefits of, of PPPs could come out even clearer. But we also have to say I think uh, the infrastructure gap is not going to be closed by PPPs uh, alone. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other things that governments need to get right, and that starts with really prioritizing the right projects, also having the government money either through taxation or user charging to pay for infrastructure, also an optimization of the operations and maintenance of government-owned assets is, is something they need to do. Another thing, becoming smarter or more digitally 
um, apt in, in infrastructure is, an, is, a, is another key way forward. So I think PPPs is not the one route to go. There are many other things you need to do as a government. But I would say in that portfolio of, of opportunities, PPPs will make a contribution. And if we learn to make them even better, it could be a lasting contribution. Great. Thanks, Christoph, so much for your insights. Thanks for having me here.